Noah, thank you very much for the presentation. We're going to move now to the third speaker today. Uh, Klaus Grobis is joining us from Finland and his topic is on the tail risk of cyber attacks in the Bitcoin market. So welcome and please go ahead. Yeah, hello and welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is Klaus. Uh, I'm assistant professor of finance at the University of Vasa and a young professor of economics at the University of US School in Finland. Um, thank you uh, to David uh, for inviting me so that I, so that I had the, the, oppor the opportunity to present uh, my latest research paper here. And the paper, the paper is entitled On the Tail Risk of Cyber Attacks in the Bitcoin Market. So I would just briefly like to introduce you to my team. Um, one of my co-authors is Josephine. She is a doctoral student uh, in mathematics and her interests are stochastic volatility and ergodicity structures in data. She's also interested in the housing market actually. Uh, then I have also Niranjan, who is a doctoral student in finance. I'm actually his uh, second supervisor and his interests and specialities are in fintech and token ecosystems. And yeah, he's a very smart guy and we have uh, many projects uh, together and he's sort of a, a fintech Wikipedia. I I'm sometimes call him, call him like that because he knows basically everything. Uh, this is his passion yeah? and he will be the first uh, doctor, uh, doctoral student who will graduate with a, a finance degree that is uh, specialized in, in fintech. Yeah, so uh, is Bitcoin a positive black swan? So in, in one of his uh, Google talks, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Nassim Taleb referred to Bitcoin as a positive black swan. So if we consider, if we go back to 2010, the value of a single unit of Bitcoin uh, was back then 0. 0.0008 uh, dollar. And now we know that it's traded around $60,000. Uh, so if you had invested one, uh, only $1 in Bitcoin back in 2010, you would be now a, a multimillionaire. Yeah? You would have now, your, your, your net worth in Bitcoin would be uh, 62.5 million US dollar. So Nassim Tal was right, obviously, um, this, this uh, Bitcoin is sort of a positive tax one in terms of its uh, payoff if you consider this 10-year uh, period. But there's also a dark side of this positive black swan. So let's talk about the risk of money laundry. So this research shows that cryptocurrencies became the currency of choice for many drug dealers because of the opportunity to hide behind the presumed privacy. In another study uh, recently published in the Review of Financial Studies uh, from Foley, Carlson and Putnins, uh, they document that about one quarter of all users uh, and close to one half of Bitcoin transactions are associated with criminal activity. So that was the risk of money laundry. Let's talk about default risk. In my own research that I conducted with Niranjan, we examined uh, all available 146 proof of work uh, based cryptocurrencies that started trading prior to the end of 2014. And we traced back their performance until the end of 2018. So we considered it a four year period. And obviously back then in 2014, there were only 146 cryptocurrencies that had the proof of work uh, consensus protocol. So what we found is that 60% of those cryptocurrencies ended up in default, which brings us to the risk of price manipulation. The recent research shows that um, sus suspicious trading activity in terms of cyber attacks is likely to have caused the unexpected spike in the US dollar Bitcoin exchange rate in late 2013, when the rate jumped from around $150 to more than $1,000 in just two months. In another study, uh, it is documented that purchases with the stablecoin Tether are time following market downturns uh, and result in sizable increases in Bitcoin prices. So the study 
published in the Journal of Finance actually last year, uh, the results uh, of that study indicate that unbacked uh, digital money inflates uh, cryptocurrency prices. So that was the risk of manipulation. Which brings us to the risks of cyber attacks. So in my own research, uh, I explored uh, the impact of, of 50 Bitcoin hackings on the volatility process of Bitcoin. And I found uh, in this study two effects. So the first effect is that, that Bitcoin volatility unsurprisingly uh, increases on the day when the hacking attack took, takes place. And then it goes down again to more uh, normal levels. And then on the fifth day, it's, it spikes again. Yeah? And what is interesting, I also investigated the, the impact of Bitcoin hackings on Ethereum. And what I found is Ethereum uh, is not responding on the day when, when Bitcoin is attacked, but on the fifth day. Yeah? So if you want to earn some money, then obviously you uh, wait a couple of days after the, 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 the hacking incident took place and then you buy a straddle and, you know. So that was a recent study that is uh, published in Quantitative Finance. And uh, that study that I would like to uh, present here that is positioned uh, in this stream of, of research. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's related to investigating the, the risk of uh, that is um, related to, to these new digital ecosystems. So what's the problem? So the problem is that uh, during the 2011 to 2018 period, there occurred 53 hacking incidents. And in these 53 hacking incidents, 1.7 million units of Bitcoin have been stolen. So what's the current uh, supply of Bitcoin? Actually, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I only know that the, that the uh, uh, maximum supply is, I think, 21 million, and that, sums, that will be obviously achieved somewhere in uh, 2150, and, I don't know, in 100 years from now onwards. Uh, so nowadays, I guess the supply is between 17, 18 million millions of Bitcoins. So obviously about 10% of all Bitcoins have been just stolen. So the monetary equivalent uh, is exceeding 655 uh, million US dollar, which clearly highlights the societal impact of this criminal activity. Naive risk management uh, may dramatically underestimate this risk. And what we do is we examine the distribution of hacking incidents and build the statistical picture of their tail properties using a very recent methodology uh, proposed from, from Carrillo and Taleb uh, that is related to extreme value theory. We compute the uh, estimated expected risk and we argue that our study has some important implications for policy makers. How do we contribute to the academic literature? Well, from the, if we take the uh, view from the broader audience perspective, our paper extends the literature on exploring to which degree social matters are exposed to tail risk. One important study here is this from uh, Clauset, Shenitzi and Newman, the 2009 paper, uh, where they investigate 24 uh, real-life uh, data sets and fit power law distributions to that data. A very, very interesting paper. I can highly recommend uh, to read that paper. Then from a more narrow audience of finance researchers, our study adds to the literature on financial markets uh, using power law distributions for moral financial data. Uh, a good overview is given in the paper from Lux and, and Alfarano. Then from the perspective of the audience uh, of crypto finance experts, our study contributes to the fast growing literature on exploring new emerging digital ecosystems. And as you see here, the uh, strand of literature is getting larger and larger. Because it's an interesting topic. Yeah? Uh, what is our methodological approach? Yeah, you see here a picture of Nassim Taleb uh, in his new book uh, uh, that deals with uh, three awesome topics. Uh, he argues quite clearly that power laws should be the norm. Yeah? And the Gaussian normal distribution is just a, a very, very special case that in real life obviously doesn't exist. Uh, so first, what, what we do is we start by using various tools to diagnose the, the, the uh, fat tailedness of the uh, distribution of uh, Bitcoin hackings. And what you see here on the, on the left side, you see the mean access function and you see a, a linear 
linear trend, upwards moving trend, which is a clear signal for, for, for fat tails. Yeah? So we also do many different other stuff in that paper uh, and in all points towards uh, that, that this process is, is, is heavily fat tailed. So you see here on the right hand side, we, we see the hill plot. Yeah? So we see that the, the optimum for the power law exponent uh, is defined by the uh, minimum value of uh, 1.1 million dollar per attack and uh, in exponent the power law exponent of 1.62. So this uh, vector uh, minimizes the komorogov smirov distance of the data. So next we employ the same method uh, as recently proposed or used in the uh, uh, in the paper from Grillo and Taleb uh, from 2020 in published in Nature Physics. Uh, they investigate the risk for contagious disease such as COVID-19. And this approach relies on extreme value theory uh, to compute the, the shadow mean, yeah? which is something that we do not see uh, in, uh, from the steering on the data. So we have to get it out of the data. Uh, the rationale of this approach is that first of all, uh, not more than the whole Bitcoin supply can be stolen. Uh, and it's, it's the same logic as uh, argued in the paper from Grillo and Taleb. Uh, obviously not, not more than the, than the whole uh, population on Earth uh, can, can be a victim of a pandemic. Yeah? Only all people can die. Not, not more than the whole population of people uh, can die. And in the same logical manner, not more than the whole Bitcoin supply can be stolen. Which is a uh, low probability event, but which most likely never takes place, but it's the, the probability is not equal to zero either. And second, it can be shown uh, that the extreme values of any distribution follows a generalized Pareto distribution. So the, the whole procedure of in, involves a seven step uh, and it's detailed uh, in, in our study. But the question arises when dealing with, with power laws uh, what threshold should we choose? In empirical finance, uh, people usually uh, consider like five five percent of the of the uh, largest values of the distribution, and then fit fit their model. In the paper from from Kredo and Taleb, they allocate thirty four point seven percent of of victims in the extreme value category. We use uh, one million dollar. And why? Yeah, well, because that's the optimum yeah, the, um, defining a distribution that has no mean, uh, as we see here in the previous slide. Yeah? So 1.62, that's if we have a power law exponent of 1.62, yeah, that's a distribution that has no variance, no kurtosis, and no mean. So that's the distribution what we have to deal with. So uh, we work with dual observations like Kirillo and Taleb using $1 million as threshold for extreme hacking incidents. Um, and what follows is that we allocate 41.5% of the observations in the extreme value category. Next, we, we fit the generalized Pareto distribution. Uh, we get the parameters uh, uh, C and, and beta and, and, and uh, sigma, and all of the parameters are significant on a 5% level. So we get a shadow mean, and the shadow mean is about $60 million, which is uh, almost twice uh, as high as the corresponding sample tail mean, which is roughly $30 million or $31 million. We then have to combine the, uh, the uh, mean uh, below the threshold uh, and uh, to get the overall mean, uh, the overall mean of, of the data is around $25 million. And if we take just the naive sample mean, that's 12.36 million. So if our approach shows that the, the, the risk is uh, almost twice as high as we would get when using just naive statistics to compute the risk. A brief discussion here on that paper uh, in Grillo and Talib's research, the shadow mean using uh, actual data is, uh, is about 1.5 times larger than the corresponding sample tail mean. Uh, the reason for why our results suggest a much stronger effect of the shadow mean than documented in their paper is that our upper bound 
uh, exceeds the one in uh, their paper by a factor of 15. Uh, moreover, our results uh, strongly support the argument in Grillo and Taleb, uh, namely that, uh, that the naive use of the sample mean would be misleading and would result in a substantial underestimation of the risk. We also use a good goodness of fit test as outlined in the paper from Clauset, uh, where under the null hypothesis uh, um, is that, that our data follows a power law process and uh, our p-value of uh, 0.24 suggests that we cannot reject the power law null hypothesis. We also uh, use different uh, um, upper bounds. Yeah, so we also replicate our study using the uh, maximum Bitcoin supply. Uh, we also estimate, uh, we also restrict the, the sample and, and use just a certain subset of Bitcoin hackings. And our results uh, are robust to any, any change that we uh, impose. To conclude, well, new digital financial markets based on blockchain technology offer various benefits such as user autonomy, discretion, peer-to-peer -peer focus, lower transaction fees, and international payments and accessibility. We know that. However, we have seen that we also face some new types of risks. While earlier studies explored the volatility risk or the credit risk in cryptocurrency markets, the novel aspect of that study is that it explicitly explores the risks of hacking incidents in the Bitcoin market. We use a very recently proposed uh, approach based on extreme value theory and show that naive statistics dramatically underestimate the expected risks associated with Bitcoin hackings. Our results underline the urgent need for cryptocurrency market regulations from governments and regulatory agencies. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Klaus. And we do have some time for questions. Um, and we still have the other two speakers with us, of course. And so I, I would open it up to, to anyone who would wish to ask a question to any of the three. Um, I, I was a little surprised by your last conclusion, though. I, I wonder why you would um, think that government regulation would be helpful here. You know, what, why is that implied by, by the analysis that you've done? Yes, somehow it needs to make it somewhat it more money to ensure that the um, yeah that that it's it, that it, that it can be traced back who that that the incentive to to steal from other people's wallets is is somehow lowered or that there is some yeah I mean because there's a lot of money that is basically uh, stolen and. Uh, one, one needs to protect to protect the uh, the, and the the investors, so it's it's about investor protection, basically. I see. Okay, so Jago, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So uh, I have two 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 questions. One to Klaus, the other to the previous speaker, Sava. Um, to Klaus, uh, I can you do your estimation based on different time period or does um, maybe you can't just because uh, you are asking a full sample question, but uh, to me, you know, the different stages as we see the previous paper seems like a very important, uh, important uh, distinct uh, uh, characteristics to say that whether you do have these type of uh, attacking risk. Um, for the previous Sava, I, I'm try to wrap in my mind on why, how does exactly that uh, attacking itself can create money, can, can make money if there's no shorting or derivative position. Uh, you mentioned the pump and dump. Then I feel like these are just the two different parts because you make money by pumping and bump. And then once you sell, it, it must be you already sell before you attack. Then after you sell, then you, why do you still want to attack? I mean, so anyway, these are the two questions. So thank you. Okay, so let's take these in order. First, class, do you want to respond? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, the, the thing is we, we have the data and uh, we base our, our, our estimates on, on that data we have. And uh, even if we change the data, if we um, take a smaller sample, we get the same 
uh, estimate. So we, we are dealing with a distribution that has no mean. And uh, in one of these, we, so we see that that 10% of, of the whole Bitcoin supply has already been stolen and 5% in one attack. So there's okay, one, well, one. Well, what I meant is very simple, just to do like uh, with different time period and redo the, redo the, the, the um, uh, uh, estimation. Can you do yeah. that? You, you must be able to do that. And it yeah, sure, 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 <laughs> sure. Yeah, this, this could be a, a possibility. That one, like a sample split test, right? That it, you just use a subsample and then check which attacks occurred in, let's say, the period from 2013 to 2016, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so proceeding. <laughs>